Well, hi there. I'm so glad you could join us for today's worship. We are celebrating the, the sixth Sunday after Pentecost in church time, but we are most of all celebrating the presence of Jesus Christ in our midst. So glad that you could be part of that experience for us. I'm Doug Gray. I'm the pastor of the First Church of Squantum, and that gives me the chance to hang out with you today a little bit. You'll see me in our sanctuary shortly, but I wanted to offer this brief introduction so that you would know how much we appreciate that you are able to uh, share in our worship. And our prayer is that wherever you are today, whenever you're watching this, that you will experience the same presence of Jesus Christ that draws us back week after week to do this together. God bless you. Enjoy. Well, with that, let's uh, begin our worship with our heart-opening song, Sweet, Sweet Spirits. Let's stand as you're able. we join in our call to worship reading responsibly. We have gathered to lift up the name of the Lord. Great is the Lord and worthy of our praise. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all Look to you, for you provide all that we need. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Together we proclaim the abundant goodness of you, O God. Let everyone praise God's holy name forever and ever. Our gathering hymn is Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
the screen, you'll find our opening and Lord's prayers. Let's pray together. Gracious God, for the gift of this new day and this time of worship, we thank you. As we live out our faith each day, we can easily become consumed by an array of tasks, only to find that we have moved you down our list of priorities. We ask today that your word and this time together would renew our spirits and strengthen our faith and give us guidance in how we live and serve others. We pray all these things in the name and spirit of Jesus, who still teaches disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And leave us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand as you're able.
before you, O oh God, knowing that we are not the ones who have the answers, but you are. We come before you in humility, knowing that you can not only hear the prayers for which we have words, but the, the prayers for which perhaps we have no words. Hear us, O oh God, as we pray. come before you, O oh God, aware of our own limitations, of our own flaws, of our blind spots, of our need for you. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for the places where we have treated each other badly, or we have thought evil or wrong, hurtful, unjust thoughts. We pray that you would give us hearts for you, and that you would awaken our spirits so that we might serve you with our whole heart. Take away the things that divide us, O oh God. And give us the things that unite us. We pray especially today for those who are hurting in mind or body or spirit. We pray for those who are suffering from COVID we're thinking of especially Ellen's friends, but also the way that COVID is ravaging our country and killing our fellow citizens. Our people, oh God, help our people. Help us to be careful of each other, to be mindful of not spreading things. We pray too for those who are on the front lines for our communities, of course, our police officers, but also our nurses and doctors, our EMTs, our, our delivery people, the people who are in the stores so we can buy food. How grateful we are, oh God, we are reminded that essential workers doesn't mean they're getting paid as if they were essential. So we pray that you would help us to find ways to add our kindness and to show our appreciation. We pray for those who are working to figure out what our schools will do in the fall. Give them wisdom compassionate hearts. Help us to be appreciative of the, the difficult quandaries that they are in. We know, O oh God, that at the end of the day, all we have and all we are becoming is from you. So we thank you for the blessings, the grace that you show us. I thank you for the grace that our dog wasn't killed the other night. My family's dog wasn't killed the other night. Thank you, God, for the grace of, get, of veterinarians who were able to treat him. Thank you for the grace that we have of being together today, socially distant, but here we are. And we ask that you would be with those 
of our fellowship and those who are part of our worship who are not able to be here, but who might be watching and participating from afar. We give you thanks that we woke today, that we got up in, in our right minds and that you have shown us the way to better health, more presence, more of your sacrificial love in our lives. We give thanks today in the name of Jesus Christ, who is why we are here and why we will go from here refreshed. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the questions I'm sometimes asked is, uh, how much should I give? Uh, the, the Bible's answer in the Old Testament to that is 10%. Um, it's what Abraham gives to the priest Melchizedek. It's what Jacob offers to God uh, in exchange for all of the blessings that God has in mind for him. It's called a tithe. The 10% number is not a magic number. The more important principle is that we give proportionally. That is, we give a percentage. Um, and that we give it off the top each month. Um, what, why is that important? It teaches us to give to God first so that we're, we're giving to God out of our gratitude, out of our joy, with great thanksgiving, instead of giving God whatever's left over at the end of the month. So by giving at the beginning of the month and giving proportionally, what I find, at least in my own life, is that, that I have greater joy as I'm moving through the rest of my month and paying the rest of my bills, doing the rest of of uh, the expenses, covering the rest of the expenses that I have. So I, I share this idea with you because w in my life, it's one of the things that changed how I felt about God and has launched me onto this adventure of uh, how much can I give rather than how much do I have to give. I would like to give more and that that gratitude welling up in us. Uh, I, I commend it to you. I, I ask that you would pray that God would allow you to, um, to enjoy your giving however you give. If you are checking out our worship and you have a moment, would you just take a, a, a few minutes to pause this video and to, to head to our website? It's www firstchurchsquantum.org and you can find a donate button there. It makes a big difference in our ability to continue to be a blessing uh, to the, the neighborhood and community and our world. And uh, thank you very much for the time that you take to do that. If that's not something you're able to do or want to do right now, that's okay. That's okay. Jesus came as grace for us. And it is grace that you are participating and sharing in our worship today. So enjoy it as grace. God bless you. Let's stand as you're able. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for all you give us. Thank you for the gifts that we have the chance to bring today, and we ask your blessing on what we bring so that they might be signs of your grace and your kindness wherever they touch. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
us, Lord. As we turn to your word, we pray that your grace would find us. That your grace would penetrate our lives, our hearts, all that we are. And we would lay before you not only the concerns of our lives, but also the hopes and dreams so that they too might be penetrated by this grace so that we might rise up and serve you. It's in the name and spirit of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. So we have two scriptures today. The first from Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to read the first five verses and the last five verses of that great chapter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And then skipping ahead to verse 26. Then God said, let us make humanity in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, so a, a word about the Hebrew behind the word God here. So can you go to show verse 27? So God created, the word for God there is Elohim, one of the names for God. And it turns out Elohim is plural. Elohim is plural. If it were singular, it would just be El. And so this is one of the passages we come to if we're thinking about the Trinity. Well, I'll say something more about that in a little bit. So verse 28 now. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening. And there was morning. The sixth day. And then skipping ahead to Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. Paul writes, But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit." since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, 
to live according to the deeds of the body, according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, Abba means Daddy in Aramaic. It is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been growing, groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, when we think of relationships and needing each other, sometimes we can get a little confused. Sometimes we get it right, but it, it's curious. I, I have some images I'd like to show you. Can we start with the first one? This is one of my favorites. I'm going to read it to you just because the folks on, online can't read it probably. I want to be the reason you look down at your phone and smile, then walk into a pole. <laughs> Not, that one didn't end the way I, it, I expected when I started. All right. And I'm missing sports right now. Honey, call me when your water breaks. Go angels. Now, oh, never mind. All right, so going on. <laughs> I married her anyways. You notice he's a Kansas City Chiefs fan and she's a Denver Bronco, Broncos fan. Somehow they've made that work. That's a good sign. Go ahead. So this one, I know the print's too small, but you'll see there's something bright off to the right. The letter begins, husband, welcome home. I'm hiding in the house with a Nerf gun. Here is the other one. The loser cooks dinner tonight. May the odds be ever in your favor. XOXO wife. <laughs> This one's my personal favorite, though. The sign says, he told me I could have an engagement ring or World Series tickets. Here I am. <laughs> and then lastly, so they're in a confession booth. The priest says, I understand your desire to have a personal relationship with God, but don't you think he might be a bit out of your league? Which is, of course, true. <laughs> But fortunately, there's grace. So to address some of these issues, we have two blockbuster passages today, and they are chock full of incredible insights into needing each other that can change our lives. And today, I want to draw our attention to two epic truths in particular. And I want you to watch out, because 
These are world-changing ideas. Perhaps the most surprising thing about these epic truths is that they point to why God needs us. I don't think of God needing us, but I, I think you'll see why in a little while. And incidentally, of course, why we need each other. The first epic truth is that we are made in the image of God. How many of you remember the, the classic TV show, The Twilight Zone? Oh, good, good. So there was an episode called Number 12 Looks Like You. In this vision of the future, when you get to the age of 19, you can be transformed to be physically beautiful. So an average looking young woman is given the choice of two different models. Does she want to be number eight or number 12? Into which image will, we sh will she be made? Or will she decide to remain who she is for the rest of her life? Which poses an interesting question for us. What if we could be made in someone's image? Whose image would you want to be made in? Would you go for Tom Brady or Denzel Washington? Would you want to be Beyonce or Katy Perry? It makes you wonder how many Jennifer Aniston's there might be out there if you could do that, or how many Brad Pitt's. In our passage for today, we read, God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Did you catch the part where male and female are both made in God's image? It seems that God's image is full of diversity. Male and female, black and white, red and yellow, tall and short, able-bodied, not so much, but all human and therefore all in God's image. In fact, God's image seems to be quite beyond the petty differences many people do seem to dwell on. Well, if we are all made in the image of God, what does that mean? First off, it suggests that we are all equal in God's sight. All loved, all valued for who we are. M. Scott Peck, in his book, The Different Drum, Community Making and Peace, tells the story of a monastery that had fallen upon hard times. There were only five monks left, and they were all over 70. They lived in this decaying house, the abbot and four others, clearly a dying order. In the deep woods surrounding the monastery was a little hut that a rabbi occasionally used for retreats. One day the abbot decided to visit the rabbi to see if he had any advice for saving the monastery. The rabbi welcomed the abbot But when the abbot explained his visit, the rabbi could only say, Ah, I know how it is. The spirit has gone out of the people. It is the same in my town. Almost no one comes to synagogue anymore. And so the old abbot and the old rabbi wept together. And then they read part of the parts of the Torah and spoke of deep things. When the abbot had to leave, they embraced each other. It has been a wonderful thing that we should meet after all these years, the abbot said. But I have failed in my purpose for coming here. Can you think of anything that could help me save my dying monastic order? Oh, no, I'm sorry, the rabbi responded. I have no advice to give, but I can tell you that the Messiah is one of you. When the abbot returned to the monastery, he said to the others, the rabbi said something very mysterious and cryptic 
He said that the Messiah is one of us. What do you think he could have meant? As time went on, the old monks wondered whether the Messiah could possibly be one of them. But which one? Could it be him? Could it be me? As they contemplated, the old monks began to retreat each to treat each other with extraordinary respect on the chance that one among them might be the Messiah. And they began to treat themselves with extraordinary respect. People still occasionally came to visit the monastery in its beautiful forest, to picnic on its tiny lawn, to wander along some of its paths, even to meditate in the dilapidated chapel. As they did so, the aura of extraordinary respect began to surround the five old monks and seemed to radiate out from them and permeate the atmosphere of the place. There was something strangely compelling about it, hardly knowing why they began to come back to the monastery to picnic, to play, to pray. And they brought their friends to this special place. And their friends brought their friends, and within a few years, the monastery had once again become a thriving order. And thanks to the rabbi's gift, a vibrant center of light and spirituality in the realm. When we honor the image of God, of Christ, in each other, then love and beauty and grace will flow from us. Second, by being made in God's image, it means that we are relational beings. The story is told that a Sunday school class was reading the creation story in Genesis and how God created Eve from Adam's rib. That afternoon, a small boy was running around when he got first a pained look on his face and, and then a panicked look. He rushed into his mom. He said, Mom, Mom, I think I'm having a wife. But be before Adam and Eve's relationship, before Adam is even created, there are already relationships. Did you hear them in those first five verses? How can that be? The real mind blower, as I noted as I was reading the passage, is that the word for God here is Elohim, which is plural of the word for God, the word El. But what we know from other places in the Bible, particularly Exodus and Deuteronomy, is that there is only one God, and God is one. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. In fact, what we read from read from Genesis today is one of the key passages for the Trinity, that somehow paradoxically God is both many and one, three and one, before the beginning. Oh, there's a lot more we could say about this, but I'm going to save most of that for Bible study tomorrow night. 6.30, we'll, we're going to Zoom. Since God is more than one, and one at the same time, God has been about relationships and being in community before creation, which means we are called to be in relationship with each other. And finally, being made in God's image means that we are made to rule over the earth and its creatures, just like God rules over us. Caring for, nurturing, sacrificing, God demonstrates what that life is meant to look like in Jesus. He makes the effort to come to us, to be born as human, to live and grow, to laugh and cry, to face temptation and be part of a family and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
Paul writes in verses 19 to 21, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. In the same way that Jesus lived and sacrificed for us, so we are to live and sacrifice for the earth and its creatures. Well, that's cool. So the first epic truth is that we are reflections of this God who created and loved us, loves us. And so we take care of each other and the world. So what's the second epic truth? That God needs us. Well, wait a minute. God needs us? Well, yes. God chooses for reasons we can't really explain. God chooses to work in and through us, to have a relationship of power and purpose. With the Holy Spirit as the channel, God wants us to live and sacrifice as heirs with Jesus Christ, building relationships, loving our neighbors, seeing the face of Jesus Christ on each other. We were made to do these things and to have the power of the Holy Spirit to help them all happen. It's heady stuff, my friends. We are called to be the ones who get it best. Everyone you will ever meet is made in the image of God. And we are part of the team that is trying to get that reflection clear in each other and our world. What world-changing truths these are. May it be so. Amen. Let's stand as you're able. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. From thine ancient church and story, bring her bud to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this
could we then pray for each other as we go from here, knowing that God, too, will go with us? So let us pray. Let us go now. As we go, let us remember. We haven't just been to church. We are the church. And when we are truly the church, then we are the presence of Christ to each other and to the world. So let us go into the world and be the church through the transforming love and power of the risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace. Go with God.